Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Uva Brandis. I'm the executive uh, director of the Urban and Regional Planning Program here, here at Georgetown. Welcome to um, our spring speaker series, our inaugural uh, series, <clears throat> where we are this spring exploring what is urban planning today? What are the facets of planning that make, um, uh, make, make uh, uh, for the profession? Uh, I'm extremely, extremely excited and we're honored to have Paul Farmer uh, with us here today. Uh, Paul is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Planning Association. And um, he has uh, uh, a very uh, illustrious uh, uh, career. He's, he's, he's been active in the public sector uh, as either planning director or in the le leading planning uh, positions in the cities of, of Eugene, Oregon, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, <clears throat> uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, by the way, Paul, we will be traveling to Pittsburgh uh, at the beginning of the summer as, oh, a, as, a, as a case study. Um, uh, Paul has been active in academia. Uh, he's uh, taught at a number of different institutions and uh, his leadership and his, his, his um, engagement with so many professionals uh, has been uh, such an important guiding light for um, uh, the profession and for the uh, broader conversation on how leadership in cities really happens. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to, to Georgetown University. Um, we're excited to, to listen to you speak and, and we are delighted uh, that he will be presenting a PowerPoint free presentation today. Uh, so no falling asleep. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for coming. Thank, thank you very much, uh, and, and thanks everybody, for this invitation. It really is uh, great to be able to come over here uh, from our office here in D.C. Uh, we're in D.C. and Chicago. Uh, I was in Sydney, uh, Australia, just last week giving uh, a lecture, or a talk rather, at uh, the Planning Institute of Australia's annual conference, and uh, I was PowerPoint free there also, uh, and I was one of the few presenters in the entire three days, I think, that didn't use PowerPoint. Uh, so that was a significant factor. They got tweeted worldwide that uh, it was PowerPoint free. Uh, sometimes I do use slides, uh, other times I don't. I thought tonight what I would like to do is to kind of get a conversation going about this concept of innovation because I believe that uh, planners do innovate. I believe that we have to innovate uh, and I believe that we need to uh, perhaps uh, take more risk uh, in, uh, in innovating more frequently uh, and trying some things out and stepping back if we find that uh, something doesn't work. But I also wanted to start out by uh, telling you how I got into planning, because it's a profession that I absolutely love. Uh, I walked the same route for a dozen years in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, from, from my home to my school and my church. Uh, and uh, the city was changing around me, 1950s and early 60s. Uh, and uh, uh, big, beautiful homes were being torn down, streets were being widened. Uh, uh, on the fringes, the cotton fields were being paved, and then downstream, uh, places were flooding that had never flooded before, and people were scratching their heads and saying, we don't understand, it never used to flood. Uh, and so uh, this led me to be thinking about why my city was changing, because while some of the changes were very positive, a lot weren't. In the 11th grade of high school, uh, I was uh, being picked up from uh, play practice. I went to a Jesuit high school, uh, and Father Cameron always had us put on a Shakespearean play, and so we were practicing in a nearly abandoned warehouse on the riverfront, um, and I'd been drawing riverfront redevelopment plans in the back of Latin class. Uh, so a uh, kid's dad picked us up and on the back shelf of his car was a master plan for Metro Metropolitan Shreveport. Uh, and uh, he said I could have it uh, and so I showed it to my parents and they recognized the name on the cover. Uh, Arch Winter, later, later a fellow of AICP from uh, Mobile, Alabama, was the consulting planner. It turns out he was my next door neighbor's cousin. They had me meet with him. Uh, I excitedly told my dad and mom, I said, you know, you can actually get paid to do what I've been doing in the back of Latin class. You can raise a family on it. I want to be a city planner. My dad came from several generations of folks in Louisiana. Uh, it didn't exactly have the best reputation for governments, governance back then. Uh, and so he said to me, uh, listened to me talk excitedly about city planning. He said, well, if you do this city planning thing, sounds like you're going to have to work with politicians. And I said, well, of course. My dad looked at me and I still remember, he looked me right in the eye and said, don't do it. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I ignored him, I went into planning, and I'm really glad I did because it's been a very rewarding career. As was said, I, I taught for about 10 years, helped start a planning program out at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. 
Uh, then I moved into practice for a good 20 years, and then uh, later uh, uh, as head of APA, I've been doing this for about 13 plus years now, and uh, it's been sort of three careers, but all in planning. And years later, my daughter, who had been living in Ireland for about three and a half years, we finally got her back to this country, uh, and she went to Boston, and uh, a temp agency assigned her to a job uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, unintentionally, in a sense, uh, with a planning engineering firm. And after about six months uh, on that uh, job, she said to me one night, you know, Dad, what you do is interesting after all. So off she went to planning school at Penn. Uh, she's now a transit planner, works in Alexandria after uh, spending about nine years uh, with AECOM. Uh, I have to give my wife full credit because I'm a planner, my wife's a planner, our daughter's a transportation planner. I was never a transportation planner, but my wife was. So my daughter follows in mother's footsteps, not mine, but it's sort of become the family business. I tell the story because uh, I really do believe that uh, uh, planners can change people's lives. Uh, if you do it right, uh, you're creating communities that we like to call have lasting value because it's places where generations can prosper. Uh, it's not making a quick buck. Uh, there are lots of people who do that and do it well. They're in, they're out, and uh, maybe one generation can, can use a place before it deteriorates. Uh, I think a, a sort of the genius of planning when it's done well is that places can be built uh, that use a very popular current name or resilient current term. They can bounce back. They can take body blows. Uh, at APA, we created a program called Great Places in America a few years ago to be able to showcase the great streets, the great neighborhoods, and, and the great public places uh, that exhibit the characters of greatness. And often they are ones that had their body blows and then came back. They had the structure. They had what might be called the bones. Uh, and there was probably innovation along the way that touched those. So let me jump into the innovation conversation then. And uh, I want to talk about everything from, uh, from policy innovations to kind of uh, uh, engineering innovations that planners use, uh, uh, because planners need to be involved in all of those. Uh, so let me uh, start by just giving you a quick uh, story of Milwaukee. When I went there to help start the planning program, uh, one of the things we were looking at was the fact that uh, right at the foot of Wisconsin Avenue, where the main commercial street of the state met Lake Michigan, the main natural feature of the state, where you had the 50-story first Wisconsin Bank building uh, with the greatest land values in the state, what occupied the entire frontage of Lake Michigan at that time? Uh, surface parking at 75 cents a day. Okay, so what's the problem here? We, uh, through a class like this, started kind of pulling it apart. We discovered there were five policy conflicts that had stymied anything else from happening. The Harbor Commission owned the land. In the 1970s, believe it or not, they were convinced that the Halcyon days of Great Lake shipping would return. Uh, we had to convince them that, guess what? Uh, there are things called canals, and there are things called big ships in other parts of the world. Uh, the Great Lakes have had it uh, as a, a major, uh, and, and, and industry was declining. The steel industry was declining. You weren't really shipping the taconite from, from uh, Duluth to uh, uh, northern Indiana or anything anymore. So that was one policy issue we had to resolve. The second was the Art Institute wanted to expand all the way to the water's edge. Uh, and uh, uh, the third was uh, a highway was supposed to be built. Uh, the bridge had been built, one of the many bridges to nowhere in the country. So uh, would it be finished as a highway or something else? Uh, the mayor loved uh, a festival that he called Summerfest that used some of the land there for a couple of weeks a year, and he didn't want to allow it to be moved anywhere else. And there were a couple of other policy conflicts as well. We, we did our policy analysis work, looked at what the, what the alternatives might be, uh, but found out that, that no one could really figure out what different combinations of solutions might mean for the city. So then we conducted a, an international planning and design competition. We had about 400 entries from around the world, won by an Italian firm. We made it very clear that there was a cash prize. It was not that somebody was necessarily going to get a contract to build anything, but they would get a cash prize, uh, and then it was an idea competition. That f helped people understand the sort of physical manifestation of what uh, resolution of policy choices in different ways might be. Uh, it's a technique I came to then use in other places. It was very uh, useful. We were able to uh, convince the Harbor Commission that uh, they didn't really need the land. 
It could be used for other purposes. We were able to convince people not to build the highway. Uh, the Art Institute was given the right to expand, but not to the water's edge, because it was very, very important that water's edge, north-south pedestrian access be maintained. If you go there today, uh, I don't know if you know the Calatrava addition to the Art Museum. It's an uh, iconic uh, uh, building, uh, and if you go there, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It stops short of the water's edge. You can walk along the path. Uh, the, the boulevard that was put in the face of the highway, uh, I think people recognize was the right policy choice. But it's just an example of how we used, uh, I think, an innovative way to help, uh, first of all, understand the, the multiple uh, policy issues that were uh, confronting the city, uh, but also come up with a way of helping people visualize. And at that time, there wasn't computer software visualization and all those techniques that could be used today. So that was uh, some, a representative of, of what I would say was policy innovation. Let me jump ahead now to, to, uh, to the current um, uh, time. Um, how many of you have ridden on a bike share bike somewhere in the world? Okay, so most people in the room. Uh, what are the innovations that were required for you to be able to ride that bike? Payment. Payment so you had to figure out how to pay. And basically, what payment systems did they come up with? Is there somebody there taking your money and giving you change? OK. So it's all a digital system, right? So it had to tie into that network in some fashion. Uh, Where does the electricity come from to run that digital system on site? Underground, you think? And, and why and is solar almost everywhere in the world? Why does solar free that up in ways that hard wiring underground wouldn't? Yeah. It's mobile. It's mobile. Yeah. You can move those things. They don't work out there. You can move them around the corner. Uh, you can put them in the street. You can put them on the sidewalk. You don't have to tear the, 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 the uh, sidewalk and street up to find the wire to connect to. You don't, know, have to yet, don't have to figure out how to meter it and how to negotiate with the power supplier. So uh, it vastly reduces the entry barriers to making that happen. Um, and it also vastly reduces the cost, I would say. What else do you need to innovate in order to be able to, to do that? Any other innovations along the way? Bike rack and itself. Rack itself? <laughs> How about the bikes? OK. I mean, you know, they're, they're not high performance uh, Tour de France bikes. Uh, they got to take a lot of abuse. Um, and that they've got to be light enough so that uh, most of us can use them. Uh, that gets into material science uh, and uh, various types of engineering, mechanical engineering and the like. You need innovations. One of the points I would make in all of this is that um, whether you're looking at a policy innovation or whether you're looking at uh, a scientific innovation, in almost all cases, innovations come in clusters. It's rare that there is a sole innovation. You can say, that was it. Even the polio vaccine by Jonas Salk. You know? Uh, first of all, there's, there, there's a disagreement about who really invented uh, the vaccine that worked the best. But, but there, there were a variety of, of, uh, of medical advances before he could so-called invent the vaccine. So that's one of the things I would suggest. And I'll give you some other examples of where I think there are clusters of innovations that come together that then allow something to happen. How well is the bike share working? Here. Here, every, anywhere. <laughs> Better than New York, okay. Maybe that's setting a setting a bar not very high, but uh, okay. So there, there's a human. I mean, there's a human uh, side of the component of this. Uh, was this the first time uh, DC tried a bike share program? What happened to the other one? Yeah, com complete failure. Let's just call it that, okay? So uh, the first time we tried it here, it didn't work. First time Paris tried it, all the bikes were stolen, and they were, uh, they were found in Tunisia or someplace like that. Uh, one of the great things they did in, in Paris, though, if you've been on the left bank, it get, you know, it's pretty high hills over there, uh, and they were finding that uh, people would take the bikes in the morning and ride down the hills, uh, but at night when they would ride home, uh, they would fill up the bike racks at the bottom of the hill and walk up the hill. Uh, and so, uh, you know what innovation they came up with? I love it. Balancing. Differential pricing. In the end of the day, if you drop your bike at a bike rack at the bottom of the hill, 
you pay twice of what you do as if you pedal it to the top of the hill. And guess what? It worked overnight. Uh, okay, so, uh, so as I said, clusters of innovations all the time. Overall, uh, for a lot of U.S. cities uh, that happen to use the same bike supplier, uh, you'll ride the same bike in Chicago that you'll ride here, for example, and in Toronto. Uh, it's made by the same company. Any, any news recently about that company? Went bankrupt. Went bankrupt. Yeah. All right. Guess what? We have a failed business model. We don't know if this thing's going to work or not. Because will the city uh, pay a lot more money, for example, to a company that comes out of bankruptcy for the same service? Because their pricing didn't work. And that's the pricing they sold all the cities. Bankruptcy gives them the ability to, to break those contracts, for example. So uh, we don't know yet where that's going to go. Uh, but it's not, it, but it, it's, uh, you know, I, I would assume that at some point they're going to work something out. I don't know if the city's going to pay more, or if there's going to be any kind of uh, DOT funds that might come down. Uh, but the business model also off, has to work for these innovations. Uh, and sometimes you'll, you'll have several attempts at a business model before you find the one that actually works and can utilize all of these other innovations that I was talking about. So that's another point I would make. Uh, let me jump back to another form of transportation, one of my favorite. What are the ways that uh, we kind of get around in our daily lives, uh, and uh, what do we, how do we measure them? When you, when you came here tonight, or when you uh, go to a party, or whatever, how do you get around? Metro, bus, car, walk, bike. <laughs> Metro, bus, car, bike, walk. Some of that bike and some of that car is car share and, 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 uh, and the like. Uh, we haven't even talked about car sharing or, or, or home sharing. Uh, it's, interesting. it's not just bike sharing. We're at an interesting point in our, in our lives that there are various types of sharing going on. Some of that is very much related to technology. Some of it is related to a generation that's accepting both the technology as well as newer ways of, uh, of using cars, whereas I don't have to own it. Uh, but it, uh, we haven't mentioned my favorite. Limousine. Walking was mentioned. Uh, limousine. Limousine. <laughs> it's one that has, uh, uh, it's very energy efficient. It is almost entirely private. Uh, and uh, it has very, very low mortality and morbidity rates. Horses? Horses? <laughs> I'm not sure about the mortality and morbidity rates, but... Uh, um, I'm talking about elevators. Uh, in Pittsburgh, where I worked for a number of years, the USX building that used to be the US Steel Tower, 2.4 million square feet, 10,000 people worked in that building. When you couple it with the Mellon Bank the next door, where another, uh, another uh, uh, 1. Uh, 2 million square feet uh, existed, we were looking at over 16, 18,000 people a day. Let's just stay in that one tower, okay? There were many, many trips in that building of 10,000 workers, where an accountant on the 40th floor had a business meeting with a lawyer on the 22nd floor, who met with an architect on the 12th floor. Um, we calculated that in downtown Pittsburgh, an area of only 300 square mile, uh, 300, uh, 300 uh, um, acres, uh, modest sized college campus, that a job in downtown Pittsburgh produced one ninth of the vehicle miles traveled of that same job in a suburban business park. Okay, LEED might give you a 15% energy saving. By locating that building in downtown, we can give you a 900% energy saving. Which would you rather take if you're interested in sustainability? Um, and so uh, elevators go back. And of course, Chicago was the place where the skyscraper was born. If you go back to that original technology, why wouldn't people want to ride in an elevator? You had to get over that cultural factor, not just the bike riders, but you had to get over the cultural factor of getting in a box and you know the box, by the way, can be held by a rope, and you know, and I'm going to get in that thing. So what had to happen to be able to uh, convince people? I mean, obviously you had to have the uh, the gears. You had to have I call it rope. It was actually a, a steel cable. Uh, but what did you have to what did you have to invent to get over the fear factor? Too many floors to climb up. What? Too many floors to climb up. Too many floors to climb up. Well, you weren't going to have too many floors to climb up unless you could get people in the elevator, right? But what, what was a necessary invention? It was the brake, okay? You, you know, who's gonna think, never having seen one of these before, 
that that elevator cable was always going to work. Um, and I didn't want to follow those stairs, follow those, those, uh, those flights. And so uh, you had to have that. And, and think of, again, the material science that goes into that. Metal cage starts falling with people in it, uh, a certain amount of force, um, and it's got to somehow stop. And so it's got to have something that doesn't shear off when the shear weight hits whatever you're trying to stop it with. It doesn't just shear off and you keep right on going. So uh, my point again was you couldn't have high-rise uh, buildings without elevators, and you couldn't have elevators without a whole series of innovations um, that would also deal with the, uh, the psychological factor, the cultural factor, the human factor, which always uh, does need to come in play. And I don't want to minimize things like training the bike riders as well as the motorist uh, in terms of how you do share the road. Um, and don't be romanticized into thinking that places like Amsterdam do it any better than we do because you got to watch for your life when you're walking around Amsterdam with all the bikers going the wrong way on streets and ignoring stop signs and everything else. Um, so that's a kind of worldwide challenge. So that's a, uh, but, but again, though, it was the elevator that made possible uh, the density that uh, allowed cities to create the business districts uh, where they could flourish uh, as the Industrial Revolution that was based on a whole series of other innovations was occurring uh, in a way that land was used more extensively. Um, I did work in Pittsburgh uh, when the steel industry was collapsing. The steel industry uh, uh, peaked in this country at about 1958 in terms of employment, but with every downturn uh, in the economy, we dropped employment. Uh, with recovery, it would pop back up, but never to the preceding peak. So I called it ratcheting down. Uh, that started in 58. In 1980 to 82, the bottom fell out. We lost 200,000 jobs out of a million in the Pittsburgh region. Uh, and that was sort of the end of the steel industry as we had known it. Now, uh, uh, there were a couple of things. Uh, and basically, there was worldwide oversupply. Uh, steel mills were being built in Brazil and, uh, and uh, South Korea as examples, the low-end steel. Pittsburghers uh, moved to a more automated steel system. Uh, and they had moved to high-end steel, chrome and things of that nature. Uh, and uh, so by the end of the decade, we actually had more steel being produced on a dollar, uh, on an inflation-corrected uh, dollar basis, but at a fraction of the employment. That's what's happened worldwide with longshoremen. Um, you know, we all have, well, I put my phone down somewhere. We all have these things, um, okay? Uh, think of the value of these things in the big metal box, uh, if you, uh, uh, you, you wouldn't, they're highly valued enough, you wouldn't put them in the, middle, in the big metal box that comes in a ship, but you would put them in a lesser sized big metal box that goes into the hold of a 777, let's say. Can you imagine the value in that box from one of these things? Um, so if it's a high value to weight ratio, you're gonna fly it over. Uh, if it's a low value to weight ratio, you're gonna put it on a, on a ship. So uh, the kind of shoes that I wear, uh, that uh, can't go over out of style because they've never changed, okay? Uh, uh, she, uh, she made, when I taught urban regional economics, I used to take my class to uh, a friend, uh, his office, he was the CEO of a major shoe company, and he would tell the stories of how they produced shoes like mine in, in Ireland and put them on ships. Uh, and uh, the high-valued, va high high-style shoes were made in Italy, you had to fly them home, because if you didn't fly them home, they'd be out of style by the time the ship arrived. Um, <laughs> But in any case, uh, kind of back to the, the, the story of, of kind of innovation in the steel industry. Um, Pittsburgh, because of its geology, um, had very small little pieces of land at the bases of the hills. Lots of times they were escarpments. Um, and so as the industry developed in Pittsburgh, it had to be very, very land efficient. That very same industry in Buffalo and in, uh, uh, in Cleveland and the like didn't have to be so efficient because the land was flat. What that meant was that when the industry collapsed and we had to come in and clean up the sites, and we were cleaning up those sites before the term brownfield was ever developed. That, that term first appeared in about 92. By the early 80s, we were already looking at uh, how, to, how to change uh, uh, our, our job base uh, using the land that had been badly polluted by the steel industry. Uh, and the steel industry, of course, had innovated in all sorts of ways um, uh, through its years, and it's continued to innovate to this day. We still make steel. But in any case, uh, we could clean the land up because land basically gets polluted on a square foot basis and gets cleaned up on a square foot basis. Buffalo's had a much more difficult time cleaning up its land because the same steel production 
polluted probably 10 times as much land. Uh, and so, again, the cost factor comes into play. Um, with, the, with remediation, we had to figure out how to clean up land before EPA had brownfield conferences and before there was a lot of science behind it. Uh, by the time I got to Minneapolis, we also had to clean up land because Minneapolis was an industrial center. Uh, it was the world's uh, grain production uh, center. Uh, and there were also lots of industries that polluted. In both places, we found out that every time we cleaned up the land, we could sell it. The private market couldn't, couldn't handle the cost of cleanup by themselves. Uh, but once you delivered them a clean piece of land, uh, there was great demand. And in Minneapolis, we also discovered that there were newer technologies that had come along that allowed us to clean up the land even more cheaply than what we had been doing in Pittsburgh. And someday I can come back and give you a lecture about uh, the details of, of uh, cleaning up uh, brownfields in, in those cities. But uh, again, there were all sorts of, uh, of technological innovations uh, that had to do with, uh, uh, with, with chemistry uh, and the like uh, that we had to learn about in order to be able to employ those as planners in order to clean those sites up. So if you're you know, a planner or an economic developer or whatever you might be doing, uh, you know, those are ways in which you also are going to be engaged in uh, um, innovation. Let me jump to one of my favorites. Um, you all know about satellites. Uh, if I were showing you a PowerPoint, I would show you a picture of, uh, of a satellite. As a matter of fact, you know what? I uh, promise you won't start reading this uh, because you'll have plenty of time to read it. Uh, I write a column in Planning Magazine. This is Planning Magazine that, if you haven't seen it, it's APA's monthly magazine. It just so happens the one that goes uh, out in the mail later this week uh, is Do Planners Innovate? So I've been kind of playing around with this topic since the fall. Um, and it's got a picture of a satellite uh, on the front page. So uh, why don't you just take those and uh, um, just look at the picture right now. And what I want you to do I asked the, the engineers in the class at uh, NYU that I spoke at in the fall what it was, and of course they all said satellite. I then said what kind of satellite, uh, and that's where I had them stumped. So uh, what I want you to do is tell me what kind of a satellite that is as you look at the one picture, uh, because it does matter. Uh, and uh, it relates to something that we did as planners in Pittsburgh, uh, and it relates to ways in which you lead your daily lives today. Now, when you, when you use one of these, how are some of the ways that you use this, not to talk on the telephone or to get the email, but if you're trying to find where your friends are going to meet up or you're trying to find the address of uh, tonight's lecture, what do you do? What capability do you use in one of these? GPS. GPS, all right. So what kind of satellite do you think that is? I've kind of given it away here. It's a global positioning satellite, all right? Uh, uh, GPS technology was created uh, by the U.S. Uh, in what way? By whom and for what purpose? DOD, you got it right. You're absolutely right. Okay, and for what purpose? It was to target Trident submarine missiles from uh, underground subs so that we, we could fight the Cold War and win it, or at least contain it or whatever we were planning to do with those. So it's an, it's an example of military technology. Uh, we found out about it in Pittsburgh two years after it had been declassified by the Defense Department. Uh, and uh, it was one of the innovations that I'm very proud of. Uh, I had, uh, uh, as, as this little article tells you, I had learned about uh, the ideas of computerized mapping when I was in graduate school in the late, in the late 60s, Dr. Barclay Jones had these mammoth gray machines with these plotters that would go bang, bang, bang and produce very primitive little lines. Uh, he also introduced me to a fellow student who was studying at Harvard at the time under a professor doing the same kind of work. Uh, and that person was Jack Dangerman, who later founded uh, ESRI, Environmental Science Research Institute. Um, later, when I was teaching in Milwaukee, a guy who had left the Navy uh, and uh, was in naval intelligence uh, um, came up with the idea of creating computerized maps for the city of Milwaukee, which no city had done before. Uh, now, that was back in the days when they had to take old maps, hand digitize them, and then to get the streets to fit together, they would do what they called rubber sheeting. So they would, they would find on this map, this street line, uh, the street curb was 200 feet out of alignment compared to the next map. 
Um, and so that was the, what they did. But, but Bill Huxold became a real leader in the creation of uh, what is now called GIS. Back then it was called Land Records Management. I knew when I went to Pittsburgh in 1980 about all of this, been kind of playing around with it. So I was put in charge by, I went there as the deputy planning director. Bob Lurcott, the director, put me in charge of it. We decided we wanted a 12 department uh, distributed system all linked together. Uh, and we hired a really bright guy with a Stanford degree, Washington master's, PhD planning in Cornell. Uh, but what really sold us was that he had helped, he and his wife had helped create the Cambodian relief effort in Thailand. Uh, and Bob Lurcott, and nobody knew about GIS. The computer people didn't know anything about anything other than mainframe computers. Uh, and planners didn't really know anything about computers. We just knew we wanted better ways of doing maps. This guy, Ed Wells, later head, headed Eurissa, he uh, um, had done this, and Bob Lurcott said, you know, if we're trying to get 12 warring departments to, to, to work on the same system and share data and do all these wonderful things. Maybe we need somebody like this guy who helped put together the Cambodian relief effort in Thailand. <laughs> so that was his credential more than the planning degree. But he was very smart, and so we, we got the program going. Uh, we had to sell it to the council. You don't go to them and say, we want to do a GIS or, or whatever, and you know, so to them, someday people are going to be used, carrying phones. Yeah, right, this is 1980. And so we, uh, uh, we went because we needed new aerial photographs. We could justify that. The city was growing, lots of development along the rivers. That became the funding base. But what Ed Wells did then was uh, uh, found out about the fact that there was this thing called GPS. And what does GPS do? Well, what it allowed us to do in Pittsburgh was to uh, resurvey the city while we took the new aerial photographs. Um, and because we were using GPS, we surveyed the city at 10 cents on the dollar of tra traditional surveying methods. We then were able to develop a GIS that was the first GIS in the world that met USGS national map accuracy standards. Remember that story of rubber sheeting 200 feet apart? We had none of that. Our curbs were where you'd find them in the real world. Uh, and that was a lot of innovation. Now we had to get the planes up. You, you, fire, you wanna get planes up when there are no leaves on the, on the trees and when the sun angles at the highest. That's the way it works. Um, that means spring is better than fall. We had the money together. Uh, we had everything ready to go. We had hired the contractor, uh, except the clouds wouldn't go away. And day after day, we would wake up to a cloudy sky in Pittsburgh, three weeks of clouds, and the buds were doing this. And we were hoping it wouldn't get warm. And sure enough, on uh, Thursday, uh, April 20, uh, uh, Thursday, April 26th, I believe it was, 1984, uh, we woke up uh, to blue skies and made the phone call, get the planes in the air. Uh, and I'll tell you by the next day, the buds had popped open. We got it done, uh, and that allowed us to move forward on this program uh, that uh, uh, gave us, uh, and Bill Huxel also told us with his experience, don't buy the hardware and the software until you're ready to use it. Get all the graphic data capture done through, through vendors. Because he said, I guarantee you that by the time you're ready to use it, it'll be out of date if you buy it now. So we, we took him up on that advice. We waited until uh, some years later, about six years later, that we had all the mapping done. Here's another little innovation that the, the, the vendors who created it didn't even realize was going to happen. When you are uh, doing computerized mapping or when you did it at that time and you have the planes up in the sky with the stereoscope uh, and the like, you're basically tracing points of light over features. So there's a curb, there's a building top, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a bulkhead along a river. And when you're tracing that point of light, you need to be able to tell the machine, is it a bulkhead, is it a curb? The old way of doing it was the operator would have to take his or her eyes off the screen, move away, and do some commands, and then go back and find and get going again. With the new style of doing it, they could use voice commands. So they could say curb. Uh, and suddenly, the computer knew, OK, I'm tracing a curb line. Uh, the innovation unexpected was that it improved their, their accuracy immensely, because if you have a head cold, your voice changes enough, the computer won't recognize you. And so it won't let you make the mistakes. It tells you, basically, take the day off. Uh, and so that was an unexpected innovation that came along that the, that the vendors were very happy with because then they had a lot fewer corrections they had to go back and make and the like. 
So there are, there's sort of serendipity here as well. It's not just a bunch of brilliant people sitting down and, and thinking of these innovations. Uh, but if you put yourself in the right position as a planner, um, you're going to get lucky occasionally while you're also, I think, uh, uh, being rewarded because you've, you've worked hard, you've worked with the right people, you, you've made yourself aware of things uh, um, that, uh, that, that Ed Wells was being aware of because he was simply calling people, he was staying in touch with people who knew things, and that's the way he learned about this new newfangled thing called GPS that now is in you know, every one of our, of our phones. So that's another uh, story. Uh, it, it continued in ways that we loved uh, because we trained staff on how to do it. Uh, the system did work. We got all 12 departments. Uh, we created the data dictionaries necessary. We then later got Allegheny County, the major, uh, very large urban county, to join. Later on, we got six more counties. And so the entire region, sort of from the get-go, was not on warring GIS systems, but was on one big GIS system. We also, because we net, met the national map accuracy standards, we discovered we could do preliminary engineering, probably without a license. But uh, we wanted to get a new subway stop built at 2nd Avenue, right where the LRT came across the Monongahela River. The transit agency said, oh, you know, we know transit and it won't fit. It won't meet the requirements, so we're not even going to waste our money on uh, preliminary engineering. We fought that battle for about six months, realized that they weren't going to spend a dime. So we had our GIS folks uh, do, uh, do it. We said, you know, look, it's just, it's just a bunch of things like gore angles and lining grade, and it's a bunch of tables. So you tell us what we need to look for. We came back to them and said, look, it works. They were astonished, and they said, you know, we'll check your numbers. It all checked out. They then hired the engineers, and we got it built. Uh, had we not had a GIS with that accuracy, I guarantee you we never would have gotten beyond the no on the preliminary engineering. Uh, and so uh, that kind of knowledge gives you, I hate to say power, uh, but it certainly gives you the credibility to be able to go uh, and to interact with other disciplines in a way that then will help you get some of the things done that you want to be able to do as planners. Um, but the fun things came later. Um, uh, the next thing we knew, uh, Sony Pictures was in town, uh, and they took over a couple of floors at William Penn Hotel. They were, uh, they were filming a, a very forgettable movie called Striking Distance with uh, Bruce Willis and a very young Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, and it was about a river cop. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm telling you this story is because uh, it became the first movie in world history where the entire storyboard was done digitally because of our mapping. Um, and uh, you know, every movie has a storyboard. That's the way you, you map it out and decide the scenes and the shots and the angles. Uh, this was the first one that was done digitally, and so it's in the Smithsonian uh, as, a, as a first. That also led to another well-known uh, entity uh, interacting with us. National Geographic wanted to do a story on Pittsburgh, and it was the first time that National Geographic had ever accepted uh, digital transfer of graphic data. Uh, so if you go back to that old issue, uh, you'll see some Pittsburgh maps and things like that, and that all was done in a digital transfer. That was a lot of fun for our staff, uh, you can imagine. Uh, and so it wasn't just that they saw that we could do things like build a second avenue subway, uh, but there was some real enjoyment in coming to work uh, and, and knowing that they were on the, in the cutting edge of some things that uh, people could actually use. Um, and I think that's something else. When you're running a staff or running a business or inter interacting with your elected <laughs> officials, whatever you do, if you can also show them that um, it's not just drudgery, uh, but there's real enjoyment in producing things of value, uh, then I think you're going to find that uh, uh, you and your colleagues and your work is, uh, are all more respected. Uh, and part of having influence is being at the table. Uh, if you do your work well and can be relied on, then guess what? When there's a tough situation or a big project, you're going to get a call saying, we want you to join this task force, or can you come to this meeting? Uh, and so uh, uh, doing your work well on a daily basis, as I said, gives you the credibility often uh, to be called upon for uh, uh, very important tasks. Uh, I had a professor at Cornell, same professor, matter of fact, Barclay Jones, who used to tell us that as students, once we got out, we would often have the ability to choose between uh, addressing problems that were important or addressing problems that we could solve. Uh, and he said, you know, if you're a little bit lucky, uh, use your Cornell education well, he said, you can actually be involved in solving important problems. 
And I think that, of course, is what we all aspire to do with our lives and with the training that we get. Um, but uh, you, you can't come every day of your life to a job and walk home that night and say, well, I, you know, I solved another important societal problem. I wish I could say that that worked, but uh, looking back at my own career, it wasn't a daily occurrence. Um, let me just um, talk about a couple of other things here then that, that uh, are in that innovation context that I think are, are useful to, to think about. And first, you know, as I said at the beginning, I think that we don't innovate often enough. Uh, I think we actually are a relatively risk-averse profession. Uh, and now maybe if I were looking from the inside of a lot of other professions, I would say the same thing. Uh, and sometimes when we innovate, it doesn't turn out well. Uh, urban renewal was an innovation in this country. Uh, and perhaps if people had been a little bit more skeptical and asked a few more questions along the way, uh, we would not have uh, 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 damaged so many cities and so many lives uh, through that program. Not to say that that program didn't have successes because it did. Uh, but I think the basic premise that the only thing that was necessary to let the market work was to sort of get rid of the old stuff and also the people who were occupying the old stuff and then the market would kind of take over uh, for a whole variety of reasons that didn't happen. And a lot of those sites sat vacant for many, many years, if not decades, uh, before some good things happened. Now, there are some good examples. Downtown Pittsburgh, one of the very first renewal projects in the country, uh, was uh, an area of old warehouses and derelict rail yards. It was not an area of, uh, of housing. It was not an area, it's called the Point. Uh, and that helped transform the downtown. Uh, and uh, uh, created Point State Park, which is the regional gathering place, place for the entire seven county area. So there are some examples of that, but there are too many examples where uh, it was used uh, in a way where, as I said, I think skepticism would have been more beneficial. Um, you know, there are some other things going on right now. Uh, what are some Google innovations that you read about that have direct app applicability to cities? Google Car, okay, that's, that's the one that I was thinking of. Uh, what are the other innovations that need to happen if the Google Car is going to be seen on the roads of America? There's inf there are infrastructure issues. So you're going to need more and more intelligence traffic signaling that gets into uh, uh, communications devices and, and uh, devices that uh, can read all sorts of things. How many computers are there in, in uh, the average car today? Within four or five computers, this is the number that's bandied about, at least in the car industry. You buy a car today, you're buying something on the order of 50 computers. Okay? What's the challenge of having 50 computers in your car? They need to communicate, and you need to prevent communication from hackers or they can wreck your car. So you want to do, do some damage to somebody that, that is with a rival corporation or a rival country or whatever, you know, hack into that driverless car or hack into the car right now because guess what? They can disable your brakes. They can disable your steering. They can do all sorts of things because of those 50 computers. Those computers aren't very safe because they're meant to get the keyless, the keyless ignition uh, you know, the, all sorts of ways to think about the their way they're being used. And the last thing those people are thinking about are the hackers that are now taking over billing systems of the target corporation and the like. So Google has got, got to face those challenges as well. Um, there are also all sorts of institutional challenges. I started out talking about policy innovations. Can you imagine the legal issues? When one of those things goes awry at some point and blasts through a few other cars or something like that, you know, who, who, gets, who gets sued? Uh, is it Google? Is it the computer manufacturer? You know, is it, you can start, start the list. So Google's got a long way to go with this one uh, because I think that it is something that is more challenging in a sense than the cell phone I've been holding up. The cell phone could be adopted by a whole bunch of individuals one at a time. It, yes, it required governments to do certain things in terms of who owns the airwaves and things of that nature. But when you start looking at the driverless car, um, I think that there are a whole series of other issues, and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not close to Google, but y you know they've got teams working on this. They're, they're not just uh, parading around a car on their campus that uh, shows that uh, the, it, it doesn't run into things. Uh, you know, when, I mean, you start with the backup camera and the, 
and the site assist and on and on and on. Um, and that's kind of where you start with that. But uh, you know, that's being done because the idea is that someday uh, we will be able to provide people with the same experience of driving uh, but lower the congestion uh, and not have to build new capacity and maintain new capacity in order to do that. Uh, interstate highways, are, are the capacity is maximized at about 40 miles an hour. Uh, how many interstates do you see where everybody's driving 40 miles an hour? You would have fewer backups uh, if people would drive 40 miles an hour, uh, but they're not going to do it. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, the Google car would allow not only closer spacing, but a, but a, a, a maximum speed that helps maximize the uh, utilization of the existing capacity. So there are lots of reasons to do that. Um, and uh, at the same time, we've got uh, lots of that technology that has to do with collision avoidance and the, and the like that I guarantee you will find its way into transit systems. Just yesterday in Chicago, uh, as I was going to the airport yesterday morning catching the 6 o'clock flight, there was an extraordinary tie-up at the airport, and I was asking the cabbie, I said, what's going on here? It's 6 o'clock on a Monday morning. Uh, and it was the uh, uh, blue, blue line uh, had crashed, uh, run off the rails. Nobody was killed, but there were people injured. Uh, and it's too early to tell what the problem was. But again, collision avoidance works in that situation or doesn't work in that situation, just like the Google car. Other innovations that are out there that you, th that you see in your future in cities? And of course, some of these are going to sneak up on you. How about, how about, uh, how about uh, civic participation? Civic engagement. Anything? Uh, anybody try to use a, 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 a something called Next Door? Uh, check it out if you haven't. Okay, it's a business startup uh, out west, and it seeks to take pieces of cities and create a kind of connectedness digitally. So you're not trying to use Facebook to connect with, with your friends in, in, uh, in the UK or whatever it may be. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's intended to be very, very local. And what are the kinds of reasons that people would want to be able to connect, be connected locally? So you know where the good services are, where the babysitter is. So you got all, you got all the services you want to use. What's the fear factor? Invasion of privacy. Well, there's invasion of privacy, but there's another fear factor, and that has to do with crime. You might want to know, you know, if there's uh, been any incident tonight as you're going to go out late or something. Uh, so the police departments are very interested in this. One of the other uh, innovations that I didn't mention in Pittsburgh, uh, long before New York got around to computerizing its mapping for its police department, uh, Pittsburgh Police Department did it in a program we called DMAP, uh, uh, which was drug map. Uh, and it was, in, uh, it was uh, financed uh, through a grant from the Law Enforcement Administration where uh, uh, you know, drug sales require a willing buyer and a willing seller. And that largely occurs spatially. There's a handoff, okay? Uh, if you find out that uh, there's been a new hotspot for drug sales, it's probably fairly well established by the time using old methods you knew that. But if you're using a GIS and inputting the data, in our case it was on a daily basis, now with cell phones and the like, it can be by field officers. Uh, then you know if something is starting to occur before it gets to be a real problem. And by, by, uh, by interceding at that point in the process, then you aren't just moving the drug trade around, uh, you're actually reducing the incidents. And so uh, uh, we didn't know that, that the police department was gonna be one of the early adopters of our GIS, okay? Uh, we wanted 12 departments. Uh, you know, we thought the finance department would have an interest, but forget it. Uh, their computers were used like paperweights. Uh, they were some of the least to adopt anything. Um, and uh, so we were talking about all the great cost savings and everything like that, but they weren't there yet. Uh, but the police department was. Uh, and so, uh, again, you're never going to know kind of who's going to adopt something. So check out Nextdoor. Uh, there's a site, IOBY, uh, I-O-B-Y, uh, that's a pretty neat site also. Uh, some uh, folks uh, have created that uh, uh, in the East Coast. Um, I believe they might be uh, Yale Forestry grads, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So there are more and more of these sites that are de being developed that you're going to be using uh, in, in planning. Um, computer visualization is a huge innovation that helps with citizen participation. But 
bringing it and loading it and showing it to a group like this sitting in chairs. That's already the old way of doing it, right? People want to do it on their sofa. Or uh, if they ever get the driverless car, maybe they'll do it behind the wheel of their car when they're not driving. Um, but uh, uh, so, so that's going to change citizens' uh, interaction with their governments. It's going to change their expectations. And I think it's going to change uh, uh, kind of the art of governance in this country by opening up uh, things in that way. Uh, the movement toward open data uh, is sort of the flip side of some of the, uh, the uh, privacy concerns people have. Uh, but my son worked on uh, an open data project here. Uh, he was with uh, the uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House uh, under Todd Park. And they had a presidential innovation fellow, this program, that worked on some things, open data being one. Um, and uh, he's just moved on. He's going to be joining Microsoft uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, working on technology and civic engagement. Uh, and so uh, I can't wait to hear what he can tell me, uh, that he can tell me. <laughs> but uh, so that's another place that, that you're going to be seeing changes in, in as you move into practice or as you continue your practice in terms of where you're at. Oh, fuzzy logic. Let me go back to that one more, uh, one more elevator story. Uh, because I, uh, I had a hard time understanding fuzzy logic. Anybody kind of up to speed on fuzzy logic or want to tell people what it is? Because I finally understood it when somebody in the elevator industry uh, explained it to me. I'm kind of tied to elevators because in architecture school, uh, we all had to use computers. We all had to write, had to write computer programs analyze various features of buildings and then come together as a class and share our information. I was assigned elevators uh, at a formative stage. So um, fuzzy logic means that uh, if you look at an elevator, uh, a lot of the room in, an, in a building is taken up by the elevator shaft. That's expensive real estate because the more elevators you have, the less floor space you have for rent, or the fatter the building has to get, the more skin you put on the building, all sorts of things. So uh, the elevator industry is uh, innovating all the time. Uh, what they found is that um, various floors uh, use elevators in predictable ways. It's not just random. Let's take lunch. Uh, if you're a big company, finance on the 43rd floor uh, likes to go to lunch early. So at 11.30, there are lots of calls on the elevators. Uh, uh, accounting goes to late, uh, late lunch. Uh, so on the 23rd floor, uh, that's when they get their calls. And fuzzy logic allows the elevators to learn uh, by use uh, and to sort of change their learning as they learn more. Uh, elevators tr traditionally uh, had to be programmed. Somebody sits down and says, OK, I'm going to send the elevators uh, to this floor, or I'm going to decide to park elevators on 22 when they're on use. I mean, it's, that's, you get the idea. Fuzzy logic, the elevators actually learn from the, from the human behavior that the elevators are serving. Um, and then they can change their minds, they can change their programs, and they learn that for whatever reason there's a floor that doesn't work on Fridays, and they know that. So they, it just, that's the idea, though. So there are any number of other ways that fuzzy logic is being used. Fuzzy logic is being used in the transportation industry and in intelligent uh, transportation systems, for example. Because again, you can set up enough sensors that you then start having smart roads uh, and smart signal systems that learn. You don't have to pre-program everything. Uh, it's, you know, it's the old style is a loop detector, where you, you, know, you make a left turn, because once you roll across that loop, there's a magnetic field that's created that signals uh, the, the, uh, the system that you're there. Well, in the future, you won't need those. Again, you won't need to embed those in pavement, maintain them, et cetera, uh, because there'll be other ways of doing that. So uh, intelligent transportation systems are uh, something that I think we will start seeing rolled out more and more. Uh, and we're not going to be waiting for Google cars to do that. Um, the, um, let me just see a couple of these other kinds of things that I might mention. Um, um, Betaville is another uh, website I'd suggest you, you check out. Um, the, one of the things that we're looking at as APA, um, when you look at the urbanization projections of the UN for the world, um, we, we know that there is a huge amount of urbanization going on. We've all heard the figure that over 50% of the people now live in sort of city-like things, 
uh, maybe not what we think of as cities in this country, but they're not rural, they're not small town. Uh, a lot of that uh, development is going on in the coastal areas, which are most vulnerable uh, because of world trade. Uh, you go to China, a lot of the development there is in the, in the three great river deltas of the Pearl, the Yangtze, and the Yellow. Um, you know, New Orleans will exist no matter what we do because it has to for certain reasons. Uh, but the urbanization uh, is, is going to require very large development if we're going to meet the needs of, of uh, the citizens of the world. You can't do it with small, precious, little three-story developments here and there that are architect designed. Uh, there's going to be big development, like it or not. We haven't done big development very well in this world, uh, whether it's in this country uh, or whether it's, let's say, China today. Uh, or if you look at uh, a lot of fonts in, in France, for example, uh, pretty hideous uh, uh, development uh, uh, from several decades ago. So we're working with the French and we're working with uh, some of the folks in, uh, in China uh, and other places in Latin America. We have programs in China and Latin America to look at that issue of big development. Uh, you know, we've got big data being talked about, but big development is happening and it's going to continue to happen. Uh, and uh, how do we can figure out a way to do that better? Uh, because uh, uh, this country, for example, we've torn down too much big development that happened less than 50 years ago. Uh, because it was done so poorly. Uh, and I don't mean construction that was done poorly. I mean the whole concept of the way it was uh, carried out. And so I think that we need some innovation there. And that means a lot of people collaborating. Uh, architects don't know how to design urban very well. Uh, most of them are, are, are taught to design objects uh, out in a field somewhere. Uh, when I was teaching architecture, I had too many students who came to me and I said, why do you want to go into architecture? And they said, because I want to design my, my uh, parents' retirement home or a branch bank. Um, and you know, those were objects uh, in, a, in a place. Uh, we would give them an urban design studio where we would give them a mid-block project and they would rebel and say, wait a minute, you're just asking us to design a facade, that's not architecture. Um, and so I think that we need to, if we're gonna successfully kind of uh, build density around the world, we need to figure out how to do it better, how to plan it better, how to design it better, uh, in this country, a lot of times when people object to higher density, it's not because they are NIMBYs. Uh, it's because they have good sense and they don't want something going up that, is, uh, that none of us would want to live next to. Um, so how do we do it in a better way so that we get better acceptance? So we use our visualization techniques. We can use our civic engagement techniques. When I was in Minnesota, uh, we needed more development because uh, the city was declining in population. It wasn't declining in occupied households. Uh, the households were getting smaller. That was the population decline of the city. What it meant, though, was that for the neighborhoods to get what they wanted, more walk-to shopping, more restaurants, they wanted little league teams that could have nine players instead of seven. They wanted to be able to reinvest in their houses of worship that were, that were deteriorating because the congregation was getting smaller. Uh, we needed to put buying power back into those neighborhoods. The way we were going to do that was by putting in density. So we had to be able to sell density to the neighbors. We would simply use examples from, uh, that were local. Uh, you know, three blocks away from where we wanted to put something, we would take pictures and they would say, oh, my wife and I lived there when we were first married or that's where my mother retired to. Uh, because n nobody really understands what 24 units to the acre make, means or 16 units or eight acres, eight units to the acre. They just know the higher number's bad. Um, and so you've gotta be able to show them uh, examples uh, uh, and I would suggest more local the better uh, to be able to sort of demystify things. Um, another thing that uh, is an innovation that now we ought to shelve and come up with a new innovation is level of service analysis. It's, it's what traffic engineers and traffic planners have used for years. Uh, it's to grade movements on a road and intersection, left turns, right turns, the whole intersection, and you get A, B, C, D, F. Uh, well, so I'm gonna take a project out to a neighborhood and say, you know, uh, we're gonna put this new development in and your level of service at the peak hour is gonna go from a C to an F. You know, you just kill the project. Uh, none of us want our kids to come home with an F on the report card. We don't even like a D, all right? If you show them, again, with this new development, the intersection is gonna act like Hennepin and Lake four blocks away, what I would get is, oh, that's all right. Once in a while I have to wait for a life, light cycle, but that's okay. Demystify things. Um, you know, as I said, our job is to eliminate, uh, not confuse. Uh, and so, um, and there are innovations, uh, both technically in the way we can measure things, as well as innovations in the way we present them to help uh, 
uh, achieve the communities that we all are trying to plan and, and build. I, you're probably telling me I'm out of time now. <laughs> yeah, I've got a plane at some point. But uh, any other just final questions? Um, I love this profession. I like to build things. So whether you're in it to build or you're in it to protect uh, environmental features, uh, historic buildings, whatever it may be, those are all the kinds of things we do in this profession, and uh, it's uh, it's rewarding. Um, jo join me in thanking Paul for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll, okay, yeah. great. Uh, he does have a plane to catch, but um, a few questions. Uh, Alan. Um, excuse me for my tardiness. Um, you had mentioned using police and technology to combat um, drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you told that story fuller um, earlier before I got here, but how exactly did that happen? I, I don't think I did tell it uh, more completely. It, was, uh, it, it worked off of our geographic information system, and it was a project of the police department in Pittsburgh, I want to say right around 1990, and it was to look at whether they could actually uh, uh, lessen the impact of the drug trade uh, with, with all of what comes with it, uh, rather than just moving it around. Because up until that time, so many cities have found that if you crack down on an area, uh, then you find in the wild that it popped up somewhere else. And uh, uh, the idea was if they could uh, monitor it more in real time on a daily basis, uh, then they would be getting the, the factors that, that showed them uh, that, uh, the, the, that the trade was starting to grow in a certain area. And by keeping the kind of willing buyer, willing sellers guessing, basically, uh, they were able to then document that it lowered the overall uh, kind of drug problem. Uh, and in Minneapolis, when I went there, we had a great police chief, uh, 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 Chief Olson, and Minneapolis was seeing an increase in homicides. It was entirely drug-related. It was, it was over turf and things of that nature. Uh, it was unsettling to a lot of people. But once he was able to get control of the, of the drug trade, a lot of lives were saved. And the overall perception of the city was improved because the homicide rate started falling again. So there were reasons to do that, but that was what they did in Pittsburgh. So was the DIS that sort of took pictures of the area? No, they didn't take pictures. Uh, it was, uh, uh, they would input all the data uh, and you, it would be geocoded. So every phone call that came in that reported seeing a suspicious trade on the street or whatever, or every actual arrest by a police officer, or uh, uh, with some people it was uh, people who were known to be in the drug trade uh, uh, and uh, they changed apartments or something like that. Uh, so it was anything that could be geocoded. Uh, and they were able to do that on a daily basis. As I said, right now, a lot of that would come in from, uh, from, remote, uh, re uh, from remote reports, from police cruisers, whatever. I'm not sure what they're using now. I've not talked to police uh, departments uh, recently enough. Yeah. One last question. Uh, you mentioned that planners are <clears throat> becoming more risk adverse. Um, are there examples uh, in American cities that you're seeing innovation done in the planning field? Well, yeah, and I, I don't think they're becoming more risk averse. I, I think they have been risk averse, I guess is what I would say. Uh, and I would encourage us to, to take more risks. I think one of the places that is uh, most innovative right now is San Francisco, uh, as you might expect, <laughs> given, the, given the nature of, uh, of uh, tech startups and the like. Uh, I think they're experimenting in, in a good way in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, they've got some challenges out there. Uh, and again, it goes back to architecture. Uh, they don't need nearly the square footage they, that they built in the financial industry, but those buildings have very large floor plates. So you look at those buildings and say, well, you know, large floor plates don't work well for housing because you like to have enough windows to go around. Um, uh, and so a lot of places say, well, let's blast an atrium in the building and then we'll sort of create an indoor, outdoor space. You can't do that with the financial buildings because they all use post-tension concrete when they were built. And post-tension concrete is a construction method that uh, is a very good construction method, saves time and money, but you can't blast a hole in post tension concrete. So they're really scratching their heads right now, and, and they're not sure what the innovation is going to be, either the market innovation or the technical innovation. 
but I know that's one of the things they're looking at. They're also one of the cities, along with a lot of others, that are looking at, at micro units uh, uh, to just find out. Uh, uh, and they're, they're, but John Ram is the planning director there, uh, and he worked for me for a number of years in Pittsburgh, and I think very highly of John. Uh, Boston, uh, Cairo Shen is the planning director there, uh, as you might expect with MIT and, and uh, Harvard and the like. Uh, uh, they're doing a lot of good innovation also, and a lot of that is tech innovation uh, and innovation centers that, uh, that, they're, that they're trying to build uh, to make mm -hmm. the innovators kind of uh, welcome. You, you know what, they're shaking your head. So, yeah, those are a couple of places I would look at. Um, Paul, uh, you've woven a very rich so, tapestry. So, I hope this is helpful tonight. to you. Yes. As I said, I, I uh, enjoy what I do, and I think you will too. And, a number of you are already in the field or in related fields, and so uh, if you want to give me a call sometime, if you want to you know, sit down, uh, I'm in D.C. We have two offices. I live in Chicago, but I'm here a lot. But uh, good luck with this. That's great. Thank you. And thank and you for the invitation. Uh, okay. Thank you very much.